أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما نافعا اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ربي شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the Reflections on the Risale i Nur by Bed Uzzaman Said Nursi podcast series. This is Mustafa Tuna. You can listen to the episodes of the series wherever you listen to your podcasts or at the website www.reflections-rn.org. Inshallah, today we will continue reading the 10th word. We are close to the end of the treaties. We are reading the truths in the third section of this uh, this word. Uh, since we are not alternating between another treaties and the tenth word, I'm not going to uh, provide somewhat lengthy introductions to the tenth word each time I do these episodes until I finish the tenth word. Inshallah, I will just remind uh, myself and everyone that the tenth word is about the reality, verity of life after death, the hereafter and bodily resurrection. And Ustad Nursi provides uh, eloquent, logical, rational uh, argumentations based on em empirical observation of the cosmos and how it aligns with the wisdom that we receive in the Quran. So, Bismillah, Onunca Hakikat, the 10th truth, the 10th Truth of the tenth word. <coughs> Bab hikmet, inayet, rahmet, adalettir. İsmi hakim, kerim, adil, rahimin cilvesidir. This is the gate of wisdom, solicitude, mercy, and justice. It is the reflection of the divine names, the wise, the munificent, the just, and the mercy giver. So we observe the cosmos the world that we live in. And we see wisdom, solitude, uh, assistance with mercy and concern, and then rahmat, mercy and justice. And we infer that these are the reflections of the names, the divine names, the wise, the munificent, the just, and the mercy giver. This truth is going to be, inshallah, about the evidence that what we observe and how they are reflections of these divine names provides for the existence of the hereafter, life after death, bodily resurrection. Hiç mümkün müdür ki şu bekasız misafirhane-i dünyada ve şu devamsız meydan-ı imtihanda ve şu sebatsız teşirgah-ı arzda bu derece bahir bir hikmet, bu derece zahir bir inayet ve bu derece kahir bir adalet ve bu derece vasi bir merhametin asarını gösteren Malikül Mülki Zülcelal'in daire-i memleketinde ve alemi mülk ve melekutunda daimi meskenler, ebedi sakinler, baki makamlar, mukim mahluklar bulunmayıp şu görünen hikmet, inayet, adalet, merhametin hakikatleri hiçe insin. Is it at all possible? And once again, in each of these truths, we are following this uh, pattern of logical argumentation. We are asking if something is possible. We are figuring out that it is not possible. It is impossible. And therefore, the opposite of that is necessary. Because if something is impossible, its opposite becomes necessary. Is it possible that God is not going to create the hereafter? God is not going to give life after death. God will not resurrect us. We ask this question and we say, no, it is not possible. It is impossible based on this evidence that we have from the cosmos as it aligns with the message that we have in the Quran. And then we say, then the opposite of that is necessary that God is going to create the hereafter 
give us life after death and resurrect us. So is it at all possible that in the circle of the lands and in the realm of the dominion and domination of a majestic owner of dominion? And of course, this is a reference to God in the circle of the lands and in the realm of the dominion and domination. These are the words mulk and malakut and they are Quranic terms. Uh, mulk is usually understood as the, the visible realm that we see where causes and effects are visible. Things happen on patterns of causes and effects. Malakut is a higher realm. It is sometimes understood as the realm of angels and therefore translated as the angelic realm. But even the word for angel in Arabic, malak, uh, comes from a domination and, and power. So it is related to the word for dominion, which is mulk. And therefore, when we see one step beyond the angels, we can understand it as the realm of domination. So it is a realm where the apparent causes and effects that we see all around are lifted. And we see the angels as directly under the command of God, functioning, working, doing things. So is it at all possible that in the circle of the lands and in the realm of the dominion and domination of a majestic owner of dominion? So what kind of a majestic owner of dominion is that? who demonstrates such vast wisdom, such obvious solicitude, such overpowering justice, and such ample mercy. How do we know? We went over some of this before, and therefore by this point Ustad Nursi is not going to provide too much detail uh, as to the evidence in the cosmos that we see uh, for these much of it is already covered and pr provided but just to give a few examples when we say wisdom what we understand is that everything has a purpose and the purpose of everything is in perfect harmony with the purposes of everything else somebody created this whole thing and he has knowledge of and power over all of it and he created in a way in which everything serves a purpose, nothing is, nothing is futile. He is beyond that. And then solicitude is assistance. And of course, this may not be immediately understandable for those who go through regular conventional education in the age that we live in and learn in, say, biology that, you know, animals almost play a zero-sum game and if there is an increase in the population of one of the animals there is a decrease in the population of another animal this is almost uh, the Dar Darwinian notion of survival of the fittest so on and so forth but Ustad Nursi uh, thinks that that is completely misleading it may be seen at a minimal scale and that serves certain purposes too but when we move beyond that actually everything helps everything in the creation if we think of our bodies as a mass of several cells for instance the existence of the life of each of these cells is dependent on the existence of the life of all the other cells it functions as, as a system and the entire creation is a system in which everything helps everything else. So there's assistance and that assistance is being sent to those who are in need at the time of need. Birds, when they come out of their eggs, uh, need to eat more worms, more seeds and so on and so forth. And at the time that those birds come out of their eggs, hatch, the eggs are hatched, the number of worms, the one number of insects, the number of seeds, the number of things that are available for the mother birds and, and mother and father birds to uh, provide to their chicks increases. It is not that they, there are a lot of worms in the spring and the chicks are coming out of their eggs in the at the beginning of winter, for instance. No, things are aligned. Things are aligned. And sometimes when humans intervene in this, 
they may ruin the alignment, they may ruin ecology. And that is an indication that the partial human will is ruining things. But that is, a, that is an exception that proves the rule. That is a contrast that allows us, that enables us to see the rule better similar to the way that without darkness we would not be able to perceive light. So there is solicitude and then we said there is justice, overpowering justice. And this will come later in this treatise in a side note, in, in this uh, truth, in a side note, there are two kinds of justice. One is to provide those in need what they need. This is similar to solicitude and also wisdom. They are all related, right? But in, in solicitude, we are thinking about concern and assistance. In, in justice, we are thinking about apportionment. Everybody's portion is apportioned duly, right? And another aspect of justice is disciplining, punishing those who are uh, who, who are crossing boundaries, crossing limits, and disciplining them, bringing them back to uh to to obedience of order or eliminating them from the system now we see this too we see this too however as it will come we don't see it perfectly in this world when it comes to human beings because of the secret of trial and tribulation and that's an indication of the hereafter of course there will be justice uh, established justice will be established in the hereafter and, and, and finally, mercy, I'm not going to dwell too much into this. <clears throat> the second, um, second station of the 14th flash that we went over at the, uh, at the beginning of this, this podcast series is all about that. And those who want to understand more of this can go ahead and listen to the second station of the 14th flash. And these are all related. They are. That's why Ustad Nursi is putting them all together in one truth, because each of these truths, as we mentioned, has certain gates, certain observations in the cosmos, and then they are pre presented as reflections of certain names, and sometimes they cluster. The fact that these names, the wise, the munificent, the just, and the merciful, or the mercy giver, uh, Rahim, not Rahman, but Rahim, mercy giver, are all put together, all, are all clustered together, is meaningful. It is not a random choice of names. And that should, I hope, uh, be understood, that be, be, be clear from the way we explained them. They are all related. So let's try to go back and read the sentence from the beginning because it is a long sentence and it will not make sense if, if we just continue. Mm -hmm. Is it at all possible that in the circle of the lands and in the realm of the dominion and domination of a majestic of neural dominion who demonstrates such such vast wisdom such obvious solicitude such overpowering justice and such ample mercy in this unlasting guest house of the world that's where we see it this non-continuous arena of testing it doesn't last. We see that it's not going to last. It doesn't last for, for anybody and it's not going to last altogether either. And this impersistent display house of the earth. And here we need to use our imagination and see that Ustad Nursi is providing a perspective for us. He's not saying, he's not just saying in this world. Yes, it is in this world, but what is this world? These are definitions of this world, in this unlasting guest house of the world. And that, of course, is inspired from the uh, prophetic tradition in which the Prophet wasallam tells us that this world is like a man traveling on a long path and stops under, the, under a tree, in the shade of a tree for a little while and then continues, gets up and continues. It is like a guest house. It is not an abode of permanent residence it is somewhere that we stop by on a long journey and that journey of course is from from the creation of our spirits our gathering before god in what we call the uh, 
Bezme Ales or Kalubala, that initial gathering in which we all took a covenant with God and then are being sent to this world in the bodies of the babies that we were, the fetuses that we were in our mother's wombs, and then coming to the world in infancy, childhood, youth, adulthood, old age, and then death. And after death, the intermediate realm in the grave, and after the grave, the resurrection, the gathering planes, the, the assembly, the accounting, reckoning, uh, surat, the crossing of the surat, and then hell or paradise. Right? This is a long, long journey. And on this journey, this world is like a guest house that we stop by for a while and move on. However, it is important. Why is it important? Because this is also a, a non-continuous arena of testing. We are tested here. And what we do here defines, determines what will happen on the rest of the journey. And this impersistent display house of the earth. And what is the testing? How we are tested? We are tested based on our interaction with what is displayed here. What do we see in it? And how do we react? Do we see it as be all and all? Just the material existence of it? Or do we see it as signs of the creator and make an effort to understand our creator, his attributes, our place before our creator, and our duty to our creator and to the rest of the creation. So, who demonstrates such, with, such vast wisdom, such obvious solicitude, such overpowering justice, and such ample mercy in this unlasting guest house of the world. This non-continuous arena of testing and this impersistent display house of the earth. Is it at all possible that in his circle of the in the circle of the lands and in the realm of the dominion and domination of his there shall not be continuous abodes it is not here it is not in this world but in his lands in his dominion in his under his domination that is it at all possible that there shall not be somewhere else continuous abodes eternal inhabitants lasting stations and resident creatures and thus, the reality of this visible wisdom, solicitude, justice, and mercy shall be reduced to nothing. Because if this is the be all and all, if this transient world is all of it, then this, the, the reality of this wisdom, this solicitude, this justice, and mercy will be reduced to nothing because this world is nothing. It is here momentarily and then it will disappear. The world five minutes ago is non-existent now. It is nothing. If, if we understand the world only with regard to its material existence, if we understand it as signs of creation, as something that yields meanings and something that is meaningful, that, that yields fruits in, a, in another realm, then it is valuable, it's precious, it has a lot to yield. But if you understand it as to its material existence alone, then it is nothing. Hem hiç kabil midir ki o zat-ı hakim şu insanı bütün mahlukat içinde kendine külli muhatap ve cami bir ayine yapıp bütün hazain rahmetinin müştemilatını ona tattırsın, hem tarttırsın, hem tanıttırsın, kendini bütün esmasıyla ona bildirsin, onu sevsin ve sevdirsin, sonra o biçare insanı o ebedi memleketine göndermesin. O daimi saadetgaha davet edip mesut etmesin. And can it possibly be that among all creatures, that all wise entity, God, the all wise entity zat hakim right among all creatures that all wise entity shall make this human being a universal addressee and an encompassing mirror to himself have him taste 
and measure the contents of the treasuries of his mercy, introduce them to him, make himself known to him through all of his divine names, love him and endear himself to him, and then not send that desolate human being, that desperate human being, to his eternal lands, not invite him to a continuous place of felicity and make him felicitous. Is that possible? Again, we have definitions hidden in these sentences and we need to go over them in order to understand what Ustad Nursi is talking about. Can it possibly be that among all creatures, all creatures, what are they? Well, first of all, there are the inanimate, motionless, composite beings, material things, minerals, rocks, earth, gases, liquids, and they all have a meaning. But when, when you rise to the rank and level of living objects, there is something more added to it. We have living creatures like plants. And then when you rise a bit more to the level of conscious living creatures like animals, there's a bit more added to it. And then when we rise to the level of human beings, there we find, what do we find? How did Stadnosi define human being? A universal addressee and an encompassing mirror to God. God is addressing everything. God is addressing everything in with, with his power, with his creation. But God is addressing human beings as a representative of everything in the creation as the chosen one, as the creature among all creatures that has the ability to understand the functions, the worship, the glorifications of everything in the creation and present them to God in a conscious way. No other creature is blessed with this capacity. Human beings are. The human beings are universal addressees of God and they are also encompassing mirrors to God because uh, I guess we talked about this a little bit before because everything that we see in the creation is the manifestation of one or more than one of God's divine names and attributes we see God's divine names and attributes in the things that are created, in the, in the artifacts, in the creation. Uh, but everything is limited in one way or another in terms of manifesting all of God's divine names and attributes. Inanimate objects, for instance, are more limited than animate objects the plants and animals, because while a rock can manifest, manifest God's name, let's say El Matin, the, the firm who gives firmness to, uh, the creator who gives existence, the sustainer who sustains existence. Uh, when we move on to a plant, we also see a Rahman, the merciful, uh, a Razak, who provides uh, provisions. Now, does the rock not need any prov provisions? Yes, the rock needs provision too. Otherwise, it's uh, the, the, the, the atoms that make up the rock are all moving. And that movement necessitates energy, something to move it, a mover, right? The, that energy, whatever it is that is being given to it in order to move it is can be considered its provision. But when we move to the level of the plant, and then to the animal, the nature of that is changing and increasing tremendously, right? So when we come to human beings, human beings have the capacity to manifest all of God's beautiful names. Humanity altogether manifests all of God's beautiful names to the maximum level. And the Prophet ﷺ was the one 
was the human being who manifested all of them to the, the to their greatest levels each human being has the capacity to manifest all of god's names but some of them we manifest more some of them we manifest less and therefore we can think about human beings uh, and think about their characters and understand which names are more dominant on them the prophet وسلم, had a perfect balance with all the names at their greatest levels but then all of us are limited and this is partly because we are uh, conscious willful rational animate beings but also because we have imaginations and through our imaginations and intellects we can relate to everything in the creation and if everything in the creation is altogether a manifestation of God's names and attributes then because we can relate to all of them we have this capacity and therefore they say that the name al-jami the gatherer is the name that is most visible most prominently visible most prominently manifest on human beings so human beings are God's addressees, universal addressees, and encompassing mirrors to, to God in the sense that they reflect all of those names. So what that means is that human beings are really important, really central. Is it at all possible that God will have the human being taste and measure the contents of the treasuries of his mercy? We are all, we are all immersed in God's mercy. Even when we are sick, even when we lose close ones, even when we are going through tribulations, even when we are, uh, we have to face you know, great disasters like earthquakes and storms and whatnot. Even under all those circumstances, we are immersed in God's mercy because even the very, very uh, existence that we have is a sign of mercy. If we are able to breathe, that's a sign of mercy. If our hearts are beating and lungs are inhaling and exhaling and stomachs are digesting and the blood is flowing in our veins and our brain is thinking and so on and so forth, that's all signs of mercy. We would not be able to do any of that on our own. We are needy and someone is seeing our neediness and responding to it and providing our needs therefore we are all tasting god's mercy the fruits of god's mercy but beyond that there is a lot more beyond that basic level of existence and the mercy that is, that is manifest on that basic level of existence we all need nutrition god puts taste in the nutrition that we take we look around in the nature in the sky in the on the plants and god puts beauty something that is attractive to us in the formation of the clouds in the sky in the flowers that are blooming on trees in the uh in the, you know plains the, the wide plains everything all around that surrounds us unless we corrupt it there is beauty and what is beauty it is something that attracts us the, the the the flower is not beautiful for the rock that that just sits under it but when we look at the flower there is something that attracts us to it there is something that gives us pleasure and that is a sign of mercy because god is exposing all sorts of beauty to us and he is giving us health he, he is giving us opportunities there are exceptions to this and exceptions prove the rule right we understand the value and, and and and the mercy in that when we don't have it or when we see people who don't have it and there is mercy in that too he is going to compensate them and that's again another you know another uh, evidence for the existence of life after death he is going to compensate them but for the general population when we see people who do not have health for instance 
we understand the value of the health we have and we see the mercy in it so he will have him the human being taste and measure the contents of the treasuries of his mercy now there is one problem with all those beauties and tastes and so on and so forth we get attached to them we always want more of it more of it more of it we want our health to continue we want the blessings that we have to continue but either they die or we die either the food that we have finishes let's say a chocolate cake we have a slice of chocolate cake either the chocolate cake finishes or if we are so you know careful about not finishing it and we don't eat it it spoils eventually or we die and we leave the pleasures that we enjoy in this world behind so is it possible is it possible that he will have him the human being taste and measure the contents of the treasuries of his mercy introduce them to him make himself known to him through all of his divine names this is really important when we move beyond the material existence and material pleasures that we see here and are attached to when we move beyond that we understand we infer and understand that these are manifestations of god's beauty the beautiful flower the beauty that it has what attracts me as a human being to it is the manifestation of god's beauty i am created to know god and to love god that is in my in in my uncorrupted nature we are all created to know god and to love god and when we look at that beautiful flower what attracts us to the beautiful flower the beauty that we see in the flower is the manifestation of god's beauty and that is more beautiful than the flower so we are introduced to that we are given this desire to have more of it to know more of it and to be with it we are attracted to it something from inside us moves us toward it and then god loves him the human being he shows that he loves him in all these beauties because god could have created us from the get-go in hell god could have created us from the get-go in a plain universe where there would be no pleasure maybe no pain but no pleasure either just plain existence but no god is giving us all of these pleasures he is preparing these beauties for us he is putting them on our way the way a mother prepares beautiful things for her child out of love that there we are all surrounded with this mercy and and and blessings and beauty is an indication that god loves us so is that all possible that that all wise entity shall love him and also endear himself to him i.e make himself be loved by him make human beings love himself because if the the beauty that i'm seeing on the flower is god's beauty and i have a love for that beauty i have a love for god so after all of this is it at all possible that he shall not send that desolate human being why desolate why desperate because he's so in need of the continuation of that beauty and mercy and blessings now he is exposed to it he got to know it he loves it now he is he fell in love with it that turned into a need and now he is so much in need that in need that goes beyond his material sense of need material sensations of need that that relate to this world this is something beyond you know being hungry at lunchtime this is a need for eternity this is a need to have those blessings that beauty that mercy on an eternal basis 
is it all possible that he shall do this to the human being and then not send that desperate human being to his eternal lands, not invite him to a continuous place of felicity and make him felicitous? And of course, these are rhetorical questions. The answer is no. Hem, hiç makul mudur ki? Hatta çekirdek kadar her bir mevcuda bir ağaç kadar vazife yükü yüklesin, çiçekleri kadar hikmetleri bindirsin, semereleri kadar maslahatları taksın da bütün o vazifeye, o hikmetlere, o maslahatlara dünyaya müteveccih yalnız bir çekirdek kadar gaye versin. Bir hardal kadar ehemmiyeti olmayan dünyevi bekasını gaye yapsın. Ve bunları alemi manaya çekirdekler ve alemi ahirete bir mezra yapmasın. Ta hakiki ve layık gayelerini versinler. And is it reasonable at all that he shall put on each being, even if it is as small as a seed, and you can think about it, think of a small seed, mustard seed, a fig seed, right, an opium seed, even if it is as small as a seed, a lord of duty, as big as a tree, and of course, these are metaphors, and imagine the metaphor so that it helps you understand what is being, uh, what what is being uh, discussed here. A fig seed, so small, but what comes out of it? A giant tree. Fig trees. Some fig trees can become really big. He shall put on each being, even if it is as small as a seed, a lot of duty as big as a tree, because a tree has many duties. Even in a material sense, the tree has many duties. It provides shade, it provides oxygen, um, it provides wood, it provides fruits, it provides nutrition to its fruits, it, it, it provides nutrition to its leaves, and then the leaves provide nutrition to the other parts of the tree, right? There, there are many things many functions that you can, we can associate with a tree. So there are lots of duties that the tree has and all of that is put on the seed, the, the small seed that, that the tree came out of. Is it reasonable at all that he shall put on each being, even if it is as small as a seed, a load of duty as big as a tree? He shall mount on it as many wisdoms as the flowers of the tree and attach as many benefits as its fruits. Yet, yet, assign to that duty, those wisdoms and those benefits, a purpose facing the world small as a seed, alone. So it's okay if the, you know, all of those wisdoms, benefits, uh, duties have a purpose that's as small as the seed and that is one of the purposes that's one of the purposes of a tree a tree produces fruits and there are seeds in the fruits but the problem is if we think of the seed as the only purpose first of all first of all there are thousands sometimes perhaps millions of seeds but even beyond that can a seed, can just a seed represent the entire purpose of all of these uh, massive, enormous, tremendous duties, wisdoms, and benefits? That he shall make each being's worldly existence, which does not have as much significance as a mustard seed, its purpose. That he shall not make them that duty, those wisdoms, and those benefits, seeds for the realm of meanings, and a cultivating field for the realm of the hereafter, so that they yield their true and worthy purposes. And realm of meanings, of course, refers to the metaphysical realm. What we understand from a thing, when we look and observe and evaluate it, beyond its 
material existence. This is a challenge to materialism. If you limit everything to its material existence, their purposes become so, so minuscule, almost nothing, so insignificant that it just does not add up, it just does not compute. Because we do observe this wisdom, this, this mercy, this, these benefits, these duties. There's a meaning to it. When we look at the flower, what is more real than the flower is the beauty. The, the, the beauty that remains in our minds and memories and hearts and in our being and existence as what is left of the flower when it dies and spoils and rots and mixes into earth. That meaning is even more real in the sense that it is permanent. It is more permanent. It lasts with us in our memories. It lasts in the memories and perception of angels. But most importantly, it lasts in God's sight, which is permanent. And, and once God gives us permanence, it lasts with us into eternity too. And a cultivating field for the realm of the hereafter. So if this was the be all and all, yeah, it would have a purpose. But when we think of it as the cultivating field of the, field of the hereafter, as the prophetic tradition uh, tells us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then its value increases, multiplies to the enormity of the hereafter, to the lastingness of the hereafter, so that they yield their true and worthy purposes. Ve bu kadar mühim ihtilafatı mühimmeyi gayesiz, boş, abes bıraksın. Onların yüzünü alemi manaya, alemi ahirete çevirmesin. Ta asıl gayeleri ve layık meyvelerini göstersin. Evet, hiç mümkün müdür ki bu şeyleri böyle hilaf hakikat yapmakla kendi efsaf-ı hakikiyesi olan hakim, kerim, adil, rahimin zıtlarıyla haşa, sünme haşa, muttasıf gösterip hikmet ve keremine, adl ve rahmetine delalet eden bütün kainatın hakaikını tekzip etsin, bütün mevcudatın şehadetlerini reddetsin, bütün masnuatın delaletlerini iptal etsin. And that, i.e. we are asking, is it at all reasonable that he shall let so many important ceremonies with such importance be purposeless, hollow and futile. He shall not turn their faces to the realm of meanings and the realm of the hereafter, so that he would reveal their actual purposes and worthy fruits. So what ceremonies are we talking about? Again, the Risale-i Nur is such a work that all of its parts ultimately complement and corroborate the other parts. For those who listen to, to our episode on the second word, the meaning of ceremony here should be clearer. And I actually would like to go, um, go back and read a a passage from the second word in order to make us understand this better now. For the sake of time, I'm going to read the English only. If you want to understand what great bliss and blessing, what great joy and contentment are to be found in faith, look at this parable. Once two men went on a journey for pleasure and business. One was conceited and took an inauspicious path, the other was God-centered and took a fortunate direction. Because the conceited man was also self-indulgent, self-centered and pessimist, as a punishment for his pessimism, he found himself in what appeared to him to be a most wicked country. He looks around. Powerless wretches are lamenting from the yoke and torment of bullying tyrants. Wherever he goes, he witnesses this sorrowful and agonizing scene. The entire country seems to have turned into a house of mourning. He cannot find a way other than becoming drunk to numb the pain of this situation. Everything appears to him as alien and antagonistic. 
All around, he sees horrifying corpses and desperate crying orphans. His conscience plunges into torment. The other man, this is the relevant part for us, the other man was God-centered, devout, and truthful. He found himself in what appeared to him to be an exceedingly beautiful country. Yes, in the country he enters, this good man witnesses universal rejoice. Joy fills everywhere. All around he finds festivals and houses of divine invocation rapturing in happiness. Everyone appears to him as friends and relations. Throughout the country he witnesses the celebrations, ceremonies, of a general discharge from duties as cheers of rejoice and gratitude, uh, cheers of rejoice and gratitude fill the atmosphere. Then he hears a joyful drumbeat and music celebrating the conscription of soldiers as cries of glorification, takbir and unification, tahlil, declare the majesty and unity of God. In contrast to the first unfortunate man who grieved with the agony of not only his own but also the entire creation, this felicitous man rejoices and finds comfort in his and the entire creation's contentment. Moreover, he acquires a handsome profit, contentment and gratitude fill his heart. Now this is just one passage in the entire collection of the Risale i Nur where we can point to to understand uh, the, the reference to ceremony here better. Very briefly, what the ceremony means is what we are all doing here. It is as if, it is as if, let's say in the spring, and of course we talked about this in, in the tenth word itself too, it is as if when the spring comes, all those trees put on their decorations and, and come out to present themselves in the ceremony before the Lord. Like a ceremony in which the soldiers pass before the king in order to demonstrate that the, the, the king organizes this ceremony, of course, in order to demonstrate his power. We human beings are here in a ceremony demonstrating God's power, God's beauty, God's wisdom, God's justice, all of that, all of that. One wisdom in the creation that we can discern and understand from the Quran is to manifest God's divine names. And that act of manifestation is like a ceremony in which we all take part. And that he shall let so many important ceremonies with such importance be purposeless. Think of all those trees, all those flowers that are putting their decorations on and coming out in the spring. Think of all the animals that are, are born. Think of the ceremonies of the firmament, how the stars are every night putting up a show in the sky. Think of the human existence. But he shall turn all of that into something purposeless hollow, futile. He is not going to, to, to attribute, ascribe any purpose to it. Is that possible? Is that possible? A'udhu billah. Al-lazheena yadhkuroon Allah qiyaman wa quudan wa ala junubihim wa yatafakkaroon fi khalq al-samawati wal ardi rabbana ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار. This is from the third chapter of the Quran, Surah Al Imran, the family of Imran, and this is the 191st verse. I'm going to read the interpretation from the 190, the verse 190 and 191 together. There truly are signs in the creation of the heavens and earth and in the alternation of night and day for those with understanding and this is this coming part is what we uh, recited who remember god standing sitting and lying down and ibn abbas said this, that this refers to uh, prayer but it can be understood in other ways too who reflect on the creation of the heavens and earth our lord so they say our lord you have not created all this without purpose you are far above that, so protect us from the torment of 
the fire. The third chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Imran, verse 190 and 191. So, is it reasonable that he shall let so many important ceremonies with such importance be purposeless, hollow, and futile? He shall not turn their faces to the realm of meanings and the realm of the hereafter. So, what is needed in order for them not to be left purposeless, hollow, and futile? Their faces need to be turned to the realm of meanings. They need to have meanings that go beyond their limited, temporary, transient, material existence and the realm of the hereafter, which is a, an everlasting abode. And therefore, whatever is transferred to there will have lasting meaning and existence. And some things will have bodily existence over there some things will have that has the, the the existence of some things will continue in there in their meanings in the meanings that they yield as their fruits is it at all possible that he shall let so many important ceremonies with such importance be purposeless hollow and futile he shall not turn their faces to the realm of meanings and the realm of the hereafter so that he would reveal their actual purposes and worthy fruits. Yes, is it at all possible that by doing these things in this way, i.e. in the way that we have been rhetorically asking, is by doing these things in this way which contradicts reality? That is not reality. That is just a thought experiment that we are doing here. By doing these things in this way which contradicts reality, is at all possible that he shall make them appear to be qualified with the opposites of all-wise, the munificent, the just, and the mercy-giver, which are his actual attributes. Is it possible that he is going to qualify what he creates with the opposite of his attributes as we observe them in the creation and as we learn from the Quran and as we have certainty about their reality based on this agreement between the Quran and the cosmos, the book of the universe? Never, then again, never, God forbid. That's not possible. The answer to this rhetorical question is no. And is it possible that he shall belie the reality of the entire cosmos, which indicates his wisdom, munificence, justice, and mercy? Is it possible that he shall reject the testimony of all existent beings and cancel the evidential indication of all artifacts of creation we need to think about it we need to not take this as mere rhetoric mere words that have an impact on our uh, comprehension and perhaps hard momentarily something enjoyable to listen to and then move on no we need to think about this and we need to make an effort for the meaning of these words to sink into our hearts and to change our understanding and therefore yield yaqeen, certainty for us. The more we think about it, the more we increase in certainty and the more it moves from the level of the knowledge of certainty, something that you just heard and accepted to the what we call the vision of certainty because this is something that we can observe we can view we can see and perhaps if we are really uh, persistent in this and patient with it and we make an effort for it perhaps we also start to notice it observe it in our own existence in our own being at that point when we taste god's mercy in our own being when we sense when we experience when we realize god's mercy that beauty that wisdom 
that justice, that solicitude. When we realize it in our own existence, then we can perhaps move even further to what we call Haqqal Yaqeen, the truth of certainty. So we should not just take this for granted as words. We should do it, but not leave it there. We should try to turn this into a practice, the practice of reflecting upon God's creation. All of these, all of what we have been reading is giving us the meanings of what Ustad Nursi has read with the guidance of the Quran in the creation, in the cosmos, and has articulated as these fruits, pure, fresh, um, beautiful and beneficial fruits of meanings. But in the process, he is also teaching us how we can also do it. But that, that requires effort for one who has the sincere intention and has the correct position before his Lord. Each and everything can be a sheikh, a teaching master. And the creation, all these signs in the creation are all teaching masters. The cosmos, the universe is filled with teaching masters, with shiuch. But we need, to, we need to sit down, sit down before them and listen. Listen with our ears, listen with our eyes, with our observation, and listen with our hearts. So may we all excel in this. May we all move from the knowledge of certainty to the vision of certainty and to the truth of certainty by reflecting upon the creation of God under the guidance of the Quran for which the Risale i Nur is providing one venue, one very suitable venue for the time that we live in especially there are many reasons for this but one important reason is what we just saw here especially with regard to transcending beyond the materialist spirit of the time that we live in you know in german they would call it zeitgeist and i think we talked about this at, at, at, at some point but the times that we live in are so imbued with colored with so shaped by a materialist conception of the world that sometimes it may be difficult for us to move beyond it even if even though in our sincere thinking we think we assume that we are immune to it but we are not immune to it this this requires practice and this requires a conscious effort to get beyond that materialist conception spirit of the time to a point where we can uh, see infer and see those meanings that that everything in the creation is so so adorned with and that is the reality of everything in the creation in the sense that they are the manifestations of god's divine names so alhamdulillah inshallah we will leave it there and continue from the 10th truth of the 10th word again in our next episode subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma allamtana innaka anta al alimul hakim wa akhir da'wahum an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin al fatiha